Welcome back. In a moment, we'll continue our discussion on the election in the Netherlands and other votes to come across Europe. But first, here are some other stories to keep an eye on. Popular social media applications, Facebook and Instagram, have banned developers from collecting user data for surveillance. The new privacy policy has been long awaited by activists seeking to end mass surveillance by law enforcement. Somali pirates are suspected of hijacking a Sri Lankan flagged freight ship off the country's northern coast. If confirmed, it would be the first such hijacking in five years. And the European Court of Justice has ruled that EU employers are entitled to ban headscarves and other religious apparel from their workplaces. The ban will force workers to dress without any political, philosophical or religious sign and must be enforced equally. Back to populist politics and elections in Europe now. Still with me, Sammy Hamdi from the International Interest and Ben Margulies from the University of Warwick. Uh, Prime Minister Mark Rutte did promise the electorate way back that they were going to get a tax break. That didn't materialise. So, you know, it's the economy stupid is often an impact on any national poll. Do you think he's been a good steward of the economics of the Netherlands? Well, I mean, during the, uh, the Netherlands certainly hasn't suffered uh, anything like the economic crises in southern Europe. They have had to undertake a degree of austerity during the current government, uh, the one that was formed at the end of 2012. Uh, so, I, I mean, the, the Dutch have done, you know, fairly well, and the sacrifices, you know, the main impact of the austerity in terms of electoral politics has fallen on Rutte's partners, the Labour Party, because they're seen as betraying their traditional voters by cutting government spending. Uh, they're the Lib Dems in this situation, to use a British analogy. Uh, but just uh, to go back a bit to Mr. Hamdi's point about economic voting, Yes, Wilder's supporters um, often do tend to be people who have lost that in the economy, but that's not, it, it, that's not so much because the economy has done well or poorly over a short period of time. It's because they were in sectors of the economy that did, did badly because of globalization over 30, 40 years. Even if the economy did really well during Rutt's uh, seven years in power, this particular group of Wilders voters probably wouldn't have done that well themselves. So to an extent, they're almost immune from short-term changes in economic, uh, in economic performance. I mean, Sammy, uh, the average Netherlands uh, citizen, if there is such a thing, if we sort of make an amalgam, they're reasonably well off. And unemployment, by and large, on a national scale, is not running that high. Most people have a decent job. They have a reasonably comfortable life. But we live in an age now with mass media, with globalization, where we can create bubbles uh, from realities. So, for example, if you're bombarded with, with media stories, and I'm involved in media, I can accept that this is a problem we have where we love to talk about problems. If you're dealing with the influx of refugees from the Syria crisis to Europe, Europe, the European Union is about to break up, Brexit and the like, and it's being bombarded. Yeah. Economic crisis, this is a strain on our economy. Trump is uh, in, in the US. All of this, you may be an average Dutch, but you're watching that TV and you're going, there is something seriously wrong with Europe, seriously wrong with our economy, and we cannot be isolated from that. So even if the economy is going well, my issue here, my, my, my point here is this. You can tell people the economy is doing well, but they are seeing something very different. Right. You can show people all the numbers, but they are looking at 2%, and then they're looking, okay, but I'm still living on, I don't know, 200 pounds or 200 euros a month, I don't see a 2% increase. And so there's a difference between what we're being presented and the real economy. And I think the government, what Gerd Wilder shows that the government doesn't, and this is the problem with the populist politicians, he shows compassion for that particular trend. He's saying, I understand how you're feeling. Yeah. I understand that these elites are throwing numbers at you that have, no that have no reality. And the people are saying, finally, somebody is talking about how I feel in every day-to-day -day life. And the government is saying, no, in a very technocratic way, if you stick with us, we know mm. how to do the government. Our economy is improving. We're doing better. And everybody's saying, well, it's what It's a are very you, difficult narrative to fight the emotive rhetoric of the extreme side with the more moderate rhetoric of the centre, that's what we saw with Trump. It? That's precisely exactly. what we saw with Trump. OK, so let's widen it out a little bit here. Uh, we speak before the um, Dutch people go to the polls. Irrespective of what happens there, do you think the outcome, whether it is a vote for steady as you go and some kind of, you know, eventual coalition will emerge, um, or if it's a, a, 
an endorsement of Wilders and all what he has to say, does it then have further repercussions? We know that France goes to the polls for its presidential elections and next month. Germany, of course, is building up for its process later in the year. Do you think this rolls on through Europe? I think it's, I, it's nice to think about these countries as isolated from one another. It's nice to think that we judge you know, the elections based on their own merits. But at the end of the day, the European Union, Europe, the world we live in today, it's like we live in the other countries. So, for example, when they are seeing Gert Wilders you know, like being boosted in the Netherlands, when they see Brexit in the UK, the French are going to think, wait a minute, if they can do it, why can't we? For years, I've had to keep suppressed by, you know, the whole concept of egalité, fraternité, liberté, etc. And I'm suffering from the economy. This is my time. Marine Le Pen, you will have my vote. I don't think Marine Le Pen will win. History shows that these people tend to fall in the second round. What is profound about the populist politicians is, the, is what they are bringing out from European society, that the fallacy of tolerance that's been there as a result of economic improvement, I, I call it fallacy because I think what has promoted tolerance is economic comfort. When economic times yeah. become hard, then it's every man for himself. And I think that's what we're seeing in Europe today. And I think that's what we will see in the Dutch elections. That's what we will see in the French elections. That's what we'll see across Europe. Plus also, the whole interaction with Turkey, the whole interaction with the Middle East in general, there is this revival of some rhetoric of clash of civilizations and the like, that we Europeans, we need to protect our identity. Mm -hmm. We're being overrun here. And the Republicans in the US are coming out with statements to that effect, and so are some Europeans. So no matter what happens, the damage has been done, and we need to seriously look at how to heal it. Ben Margulies, are you as pessimistic as Sammy, that in a sense there's a genie out of the bottle here, that once this kind of rhetoric gains traction in one country, then another, then another, a snowball effect happens? I think it's... I don't know if it's so much the Dutch election is going to affect other elections as it may represent uh, what Mr. Hamdi was saying was a kind of trend toward this uh, increasing sense of protest among segments of the electorate and uh, again this increasing fear of an Islamic other uh, which is certainly growing and there's certainly that sense of fear increases a desire for an authoritarian or an exclusionary alternative. Uh, whether it will be a snowball effect, uh, I mean, it, it's, that narrative sounds, after Brexit and Trump, it sounds logical, but I don't know if history really runs in such a, you know, in such a straight line. I, I don't, you know, yes, uh, you know, these populist movements feed on and interact with each other, but it also increases... You know, it can also discourage people from voting populist if they think that Trump is dangerous or uh, if a majority of people think that Trump's model is unfavorable. You know, they, these things don't, you know, if you take the often used uh, example of the 30s, yes, you saw fascism and dictators win in many parts of Europe, but in other places, liberal democracy was resilient. So. Uh, I definitely think there is a populist and authoritarian trend. I wouldn't necessarily say it's going to go forward as some sort of straightforward domino effect. Ben Margulies, thank you very much indeed. And Sami Hamdi, thank you for your contribution as well. Now, we end our program with the Insight Bite, a little something that we feel you should know. One of the world's most famous and valuable violins has returned to the New York stage after being missing for 36 years. The missing Stradivarius was stolen from the dressing room of its owner, the Polish virtuoso Roma Totenberg, in 1980. The instrument was discovered in the possession of the wife of one of Totenberg's late students. Having inherited it from her husband when he died, she was having it appraised when the discovery was made. The violin has now been returned to Totenberg's family. And that's all from me for now. I'm Martin Stanford. That was Insight. Thank <laughs> you.